Many complex systems have multiple steady states or tractors that they can converge to. An ecological system can either thrive, survive, or collapse. The climate can become a complete disaster in 50 years, or it can remain habitable for thousands of years to come. Even a video game can have multiple endings. So how do we know which outcome are we headed towards? To answer this question, we need to study basins of attraction. So what is a basin of attraction? Imagine a space formed by all possible states a system can adopt. A basin of attraction is a collection of points in that space that converge to the same attractor as the system evolves. In other words, it maps initial conditions to final outcomes. What's fascinating about basins is that even simple-looking systems can have complicated basins. Here is a simple system that you can build on your kitchen countertop. Just take three magnets and put them on a flat surface equal distance from each other. Now, hang a magnetic pendulum in the middle. It would wander around for a while, then eventually it would settle down onto one of the three magnets. Can we predict which one, given the information about where we released the pendulum? Well, we can look at the basins of attraction for the three magnets. If we started close to the blue magnet, for example, it would eventually settle down onto the blue magnet. But further away from the magnets, the three basins, they all became intermingled with each other and start to resemble an abstract watercolor painting. Things can get even more complicated very easily. If we add periodic forcing to the pendulum, the basin boundaries, they would become true fractals. And it made it very hard to predict which attractor the system would settle down onto if we started close to the basin boundaries. Is that as complicated as a basin can get? No. Here is something called WADA basins, for which all basins share the same boundary. That means a point on the boundary is shared by all three basins. Can you imagine a map in which Mexico, the US, and Canada, they all share their entire border together, and no matter at which location you enter the US from Mexico, you can also enter Canada at that same location? You see, that's something that takes imagination to construct even when we have complete freedom, yet it arises naturally in simple settings, such as finding roots in polynomials. The basins you see here, they come from applying Newton's methods to finding the three roots of z, z cubed equal to 1. Finally, I shall mention that if basins have water properties, then they automatically have fractal basin boundaries. Can basins get even weirder? Well, yes. For example, by looking at some simple networks of logistic maps, we can find an extreme version of fractal basins called riddled basins. In the previous examples, only the basin boundaries are fractals. Here, it is fractal everywhere. In particular, the basin and its boundary are the same thing, although the basins have non-zero volume. As a consequence, there's no place in the basin that is safe. An arbitrarily small perturbation still have a chance to kick you to a different attractor no matter where you are. Now, there's an important class of systems for which we don't have to worry about any of those weird basins that we just encountered. Those are systems whose dynamics follow the gradient of some energy landscapes. They're ubiquitous in physics and biology and underlie processes such as protein folding and cell differentiation. Although there's no more fractal basins, the landscapes associated with those systems are often high-dimensional and can be littered with local minima that are competing for the available state space. But this high-dimensionality creates new complexities for the basins. 
To explore this question, let's look at a simple system made of chromotor oscillators. This system strikes a nice balance between analytical tractability and its ability to produce interesting dynamics. We will also see later that it tells us something important about high-dimensional basins in general. In this particular system, we know the location of all local minima in the landscape. So here's a natural question. What will be the sizes for those basins? This turned out to be a tricky question. In particular, people measured basin sizes in that system using two different methods, and they get completely different results. The first method used a global perspective. So you simply sample points in the entire state space uniformly and randomly. And starting from those points, we evolve the system until they settle down onto the corresponding attractor. Now, by counting how many times each attractor has been reached, we can infer the size of the basins. If we rank the basins from the largest to the smallest using index Q, then we can show the basin size decreases super exponentially with Q. The second method uses a more local perspective by gradually moving away from the attractor until it exits the basin. Now, by measuring the exit distance d and approximating basins using hypercubes, we can deduce the basin size. In this case, you will find that the basin size v decreases only exponentially with q. Well, we know that the two scalings cannot both be correct, so which one shall we trust? Here's a simple clue suggesting that the second method and the hypercube picture needs a serious second look. If we look at a large number of oscillators, say 83 of them, and sum up the volume of the hypercubes corresponding to each basin, we will find that it only accounts for a tiny fraction of the entire state space. So if not hypercubes, then what shall the basins look like? We know that the hypercubes they misses almost the entire state space. This suggests that the basins they leak outside of their hypercube-like core and form tentacles like an octopus. Moreover, in high-dimensional spaces, the vast majority of the basin volume is concentrated in those tentacles and far away from the local minimum. We can detect those tentacles by shooting rays out of the local minimum and see if they intersect the basins at disjoint intervals. If a ray exits a basin at one point, but then it returns to the same basin and do that over and over again, then that tells us that the basins have meandering tentacles like an octopus. So when shall we expect basins to have tentacles? Well, it is difficult to give a precise statement here because there are just so many ways a state space can be divided. However, we know that localized shapes are very inefficient in filling high-dimensional spaces. You need exponentially many eggs to fill a room as the number of dimensions is increased. So if the number of attractors in your system increases sub-exponentially with the system dimension, then we know there must be some tentacles lurking around. For example, for the chromodo system we just looked at, the number of attractors grows linearly with the number of oscillators in the system. Aside from oscillator networks, people have also found basins with similar structures in power grids and granular materials. Going forward, I think two very promising systems to look for basins with tentacles are neural networks and protein folding. Both systems are governed by high-dimensional energy landscapes. If we can characterize basin tentacles in these systems, then it could tell us important things about how neural networks learn and how proteins fold. So what is your favorite complex system, and how do you expect basins to look like in that system? Feel free to drop me a note and share your thoughts. Thank you.